Welcome to the Courtauld Institute of Art for a very special event tonight with uh, our dear friend, performer, and really one of the most beloved of artists uh, of Iranian descent, uh, Susan Dehim. Uh, so my name is Susan Babai, and in order not to have Susan only with Susan, we have Veli to bring us together as well. And I will introduce everyone uh, shortly. Uh, I want to just say a word about the fact that we have been fully booked and uh, requests have been coming in, so there may be more people. We hope that those who wanted to come show up, in which case then... The tube was closed, that's why. Oh, the tube. Oh, okay. Well, there's always something, right? <laughs> My bus was late too. But so, uh, just for those who are sitting comfortably, to be alert to the fact that you might have to move. But until then, welcome and, uh, and enjoy this evening. So I teach here at the Courtauld Institute of Art. We are a university, a college of the University of London. We teach history of art and architecture, curation of the art museum, and conservation. And we are temporarily in this uh, building, which has served us very well, uh, until our uh, home at Somerset House is restored to its uh, university glories. We want it to be particularly suited to what we need uh, to do. And the gallery will re reopen as well in about a year and a half or two years. Uh, so please do keep an eye on what we do. Um, I teach history of the arts of Iran and the Islamic world, so I'm post-antique period specialist. I also teach and write on contemporary arts of Iran. Uh, and indeed, this series comes uh, courtesy of a very close relationship with Iran Heritage Foundation, uh, which has been a huge supporter of us. Uh, with Dr. John Curtis, the executive direction of, uh, director of the Iran Heritage Foundation, who is here, and I thank him for being here, as well as supporting us. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, a number of important uh, trustees, uh, who some of whom are here, as in Ina Sarikhani and the Sarikhani family, who have been uh, enormously helpful in establishing a new series of talks at the Courtauld under the rubric of artists in con con conversation. And it's always with me, actually. So uh, I, uh, we had our first of the series with Reza Aramesh. That was in uh, May. And very well attended and a really wonderful event. And we are working towards the next one, uh, which would potentially be in uh, May. So in other words, we are working on uh, two terms, each with one of these events taking place at the Courtauld. Uh, tonight's event uh, is a, a real pleasure for me to personally to uh, have been able to organize. Uh, Susan Dehim, uh, a, a very well-known uh, performer, performance artist, uh, and an extraordinary uh, uh, presence in contemporary arts of Iran and the performing arts of Iran, uh, uh, has been very kind to accept to come this long distance and to take part in this program. She is a performer. She stands, uh, as you all know very well, she stands on a stage with light and sound and all the, all the accoutrements of a performance. Uh, but I've asked her to present tonight. This is much harder for her to actually perform through a, a different context. And I'm really grateful to her for having accepted to do this. I'm a Susan Dehim groupie. I've told her this before. I got to know about her in, the, in those experimental years of her work, which she talks about in New York. And I went to a performance of hers at the Brooklyn Academy of Music 
the edgy place in those days uh, in Brooklyn, New York. And I came out thinking, I have found my particular uh, sort of musical goddess. And there I was. I followed with Richard Horwitz, the great composer who works very closely with Susan and is here as well. And he kindly shared with me a recording of Susan's, and I've not stopped following her since. It's hard not, uh, not to follow her once you know her. Um, she is very well known to this audience, and I would like to, I've already spoken more than I needed to. This reminds me, please turn off your phones. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder as well. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to make the introductions short and then use the time that she herself will introduce her work to then discuss some of that with her. Please, if you need more information, we have a biography of her, short biography of her, on the website of the Courtauld as well. But I want to highlight two things. One is the extraordinary uh, range in her voice and her musical uh, uh, sort of performative aspects. Two, to say that while we work on uh, visual cultures of uh, the world actually, uh, this is a very important point for me to make, which is that we also deal with performing arts and performance as part of this larger uh, constellation of visual cultures that um, we deal with. And I'm very, very happy to have Susan de Him uh, talk tonight uh, and share with us some of uh, snippets, actually, bits and pieces of her work uh, and introduce us to what she has done thus far. Uh, in this conversation, Vali Mahluji joins us, who is a London-based curator and a fa the founder of the Archaeology of the Final Decade, a very important platform, a non-profit curatorial and educational platform, which has been promoting the works of such important uh, uh, Iranian artist, but also beyond that, as Kaveh Golestan, for instance, for which Tate Modern has dedicated a room uh, uh, for uh, the collection that um, Valley has brought to it. I also want to acknowledge here uh, the presence of Richard Horowitz, uh, an American composer who spent a lot of time in France and Morocco and is an expert in the traditions of musical traditions of sub-Saharan Africa, and especially the trance music, which in fact is a point of also collaborative projects between Susan and Richard as well. You will hear about Richard's work and, and uh, uh, also hear the work uh, through the night as well. He's a Golden Globe winner and uh, indeed uh, very well known for uh, many of his projects, including movies such as The Sheltering Sky uh, of Bernardo Bertolucci. Uh, so, since Suzanne gets to talk about all her work, I will stop here. And um, we begin with Suzanne starting um, to give us an introduction, a brief introduction, some uh, of her work that she presents to us. And then once she is finished with all of that, uh, Vanny and I will start with a conversation with her. At the end of it, if, uh, if gods were to look down upon us kindly, we might have a Q&A moment, uh, but no promises on that. Uh, but then we have a drinks with her in, uh, on the second floor in what is known as the research forum uh, room, uh, seminar room. So I hope you will join us in both uh, welcoming Susan Dehim and Vali Mahluji, uh, but also join us afterwards for drinks. Thank you. <laughs> I never thought that um, the mic on. Okay. First of all, it's absolutely a privilege to be in this institution. Um, every high curator I've met in the last few months and said I was 
kind of presentation here, they said, oh, I'm, I've graduated from that institution. So I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, um, and also to be in London, which is one of my favorite cities. We lived here uh, with Richard for five years in the 90s. Um, funny that what comes to my mind um, initially is William Burroughs we saying language is a, is a virus from outer space. I very open to receiving all kinds of things from outer space, uh, and I think most of you that who know my work, you know that I reside in Sandra's space is the place. So the fact that I have to talk about my my work, uh, which I never can see after it's done, like my performances, I never have the courage to see them. But because of this occasion, I was able to look back 35 years ago and find things that I, um, from the wild times to the wise times, and I thought, I hope that I will end up in wilderness itself. <laughs> so this is a journey through all of that. Uh, I think you know that my work is non-linear. Uh, not language-based, and sometimes anti-language. Uh, this is a big statement to make, especially if we have Ben Okri here. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm saying that because I'm humble towards my lack of uh, relationship because of my dyslexic tendency. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I arrived in New York um, in the 1980s, uh, high hopes of learning much, much, much returning home and doing much, much, much. That didn't happen, and New York was uh, a place where everyone came from another place, and everyone supported each other in being absolutely in your own space and boundary-free, geographically, culturally, and completely have your artistic flight be based on your own stream of consciousness, your own sense of abstraction for your own out of respect to what abstraction means, ritual means, and um, so we will see a whole bunch of things tonight, and I think that I would let you experience the, the snippets of uh, works from like 35 years ago till now, and then we can discuss with language, which hopefully I could justify talking about the work. The first piece is called Turbulent, it's a collaboration I did with Shirin Neshat, that won the uh, Golden Lion at the Venice Biennial. It's a very uh, passionate and ritualistic work and in which I'm using um, extended vocal techniques which will go back to uh, a term used by Grotowski, um, giving all the attention to the theater of the body uh, and no language. And uh, so we gradually go through these videos and then I explain more. And then we have two astounding curators here who could probably help me be my best tonight. So I'm going to play uh, Susan's uh, videos from the side, so to, just to help Susan. This is Turbulent from 1999.
Well, she tried to communicate <laughs> certain thoughts and emotions. series of videos that we will see is from a performance, uh, part of a uh, one woman operas that uh, the legendary Ellen Stewart at La Mama produced for Richard Horowitz and I. And uh, at that point we were really under influence of uh, sur French surrealism. And so uh, the tableaus are quite abstract, but each of, each of which, as you will see, are qu quite provocative. And, um, very much influenced by the theater of the absurd. So I would just let you see it and then maybe at the end we can discuss. Um, Vali was asking me, what do they represent to you? I said, well, fearless, uh, faceless face of exile, an erotic dream, fractured love, Medea's revolt, gender ambiguity. So you will experience these somehow.
So at that point in time, I had come from many years in classical ballet and many, many different forms of Western traditions of uh, Maris Cunningham, Martha Graham, uh, Alvin Nicolais, uh, all of the above. And then I got to New York. Um, I was part of the entered Bejar's Ballet of the 20th century, which was the dream of my life. I met him in Iran. We talk about that later. And when I entered the company, I just could not stand the anorexic women behavior with carrot eating. And I was looking for something much more philosophical. Louis Bejar was my idol, and his father was a very important French philosopher. And he was a historian, an anthropologist, and a, just much deeper dimensions that classical ballet would allow, especially the girls. So uh, in the middle of hostage crisis, I told Bejar that I'm, I'm actually leaving, and he thought I was crazy. But I was young, and I was crazy, and I hope that I'm still crazy. Um, so he actually supported my departure, despite his will, and I went to New York, did a whole bunch of lying, and I got in, and that was the beginning of my exile. When I got to New York, I, a friend of mine introduced me to Ellen Stewart, who is who's the godmother of experimental theater in, in, in the US, especially at that point. Uh, La Mama ETC was an atelier of experimentation for theater directors, anyone you can imagine, from Peter Brook, Bob Wilson, Sam Shepard, Harvey Keitel, Jessica Lang, everyone you could imagine that was really doing intense, interesting, innovative works, Tadosh Kantor, Andre Serban, they all went through Ellen Stewart to establish themselves. Some of these people also had really good commissions from the Shiraz Arts Festival, and we get to that, and they created the initial works through those 1972 to 76, I think. Um, and there, uh, disappointed with the Western dance world, not that I didn't like it, I just wasn't really responding to my um, ego, I guess. Um, I ran into a tradition called Buto, which is a tradition of dance that was created in post-war Japan, a sort of anti-Japanese traditional no theater, which is a very deep, very interesting, and the most abstract dance tradition I've ever seen in my life, and also anti-the Western um, tradition, came from a lot of uh, information and training, body training, strenuous body training from martial arts, uh, Asian martial arts, and into this very sort of post-existentialist, um, nihilist but not uh, body movement that from this distance to that distance you could take literally an hour. Some of you know that tradition, I'm sure. And somehow the, the stillness in that and the whole meditative aspect of void and space and completely captured my heart. So this whole performance, although the metaphors are European or from different um, social environments, the style of movement that I was involved with was from Bhutto, which is really a philosophical dance form. And um, it just created its own uh, landscape in, in, in those days. And these are also some of the other works that we did. So. Um, this next video was done for us, for Richard Harris and I. Um, our first album was called Desert Equations. Uh, we met in New York in a studio called Nose New York. I was doing my experimental vocal stuff. And Richard had just come from Morocco with his babouche and a, and a briefcase, metallic briefcase and a, a Moroccan kind of pants. I'm like, who is this guy? And the, the studio said, no, you guys should meet because you have some kind of a connection. So. That's a long story. We met, and uh, he gave us his keys and said, you guys should do a record together. That was very generous, and actually we worked at nights, and we had an album out called Desert Equations that was in its own time uh, considered a cult album because it was way out of the box and way out of following any specific tradition, and it worked. Sometimes experimentation matters because it leads you to another um, uh, someone else would actually do the right thing, but you kind of created the right questioning. But that album actually worked. And so um, a Japanese artist uh, did a music video for us. And this was the time where Einstein and Neubaden, the, 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 the industrial German noise uh, band, was really hot. And everyone in New York was doing completely abstract sonic works. and to the point that I couldn't even sing a melody. People thought, oh, how traditional. I mean, we always just 
screamed and screeched and do anything with vocals that didn't sound referential but singing a nice melody. So it comes from that kind of mentality. It's, I guess it's my punk rock era. <laughs> Eccentric indeed. Um, <laughs> the stuff of youth. <laughs> I actually uh, think there's something uh, wonderful about being self-deprecating. I never can see my videos after the performance is done. It takes me a long time before I can see myself. It's like, are you joking? Really? Are you serious? And so it was really interesting because of uh, this event and because Valley was pushing me into like capturing some of these old videos that I gathered them and every time Valley said, can we put this? I said, no, no, no. That's, that is absolutely out of the question that people are going to see my breast out. It's like, no, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> anyway, um, so this ne next track is also uh, interesting in the sense that uh, it was created, I, I wrote it in a, it's a very sort of futuristic, electronic, cyberpunk kind of sensibility came from all the inspiration we all had from William Gibson. And uh, it was in the heart of hostage, uh, not hostage crisis, homeless crisis in New York that was like so heartrending. So we wrote, I wrote this, this track that is sort of, comes from a sort of a dystopian, dysfunctional um, sort of environment. And uh, it, was a, it was an homage to homeless, and it's called um, No Hot Meal for the Stray Dog. <laughs> Dedicated to you. Yeah. 
is really uh, <clears throat> not up to it, but hey, you know, we, we're in this prestigious institution of like presenting like punk rock uh, uh, from like another era of sensibilities. Um, so yeah, as you see, there are all these different personas showing up in this sort of Blade Runner atmosphere from the barking dog to the Reagan was running those days. So this whole no hot meal for the stay dog came from him uh, and uh, all of the above. So, um, just uh, to get back more into the source, which is music for me, um, just wanted to play a collaboration with uh, Jan Kaczmarek, a Polish composer who has done a lot in Hollywood, but he's a wonderful, actually quite involved in politics in Poland. We, he won uh, an Oscar for uh, Finding Neverland. And we had a great connection. He invited me a couple of times to perform in Poland. Um, the first video was with the Polish uh, National Radio Orchestra, and I couldn't be more miserable. I just hated every minute of it. And I thought, I thought this, I'm never ever going to perform with an orchestra because when you ask about a microphone, they go like, what? Microphone? I'm like, yes, microphone, and this is the brand, and this is the reverb setting, and this is the delay setting, and I have an ear. It's like dealing with like another like era, like Renaissance times with these people. Anyway, so it was, and then when the whole thing was finished, um, and people, a lot of people congratulated me, and I'm like, oh my god, you know. So again, the self-deprecation, which is really good for your growth. A few months after, they send me the video, and I'm like, oh my god, it's not too bad. <laughs> it's so full. We had the blessing of having a Spanish conductor, and, uh, and he understood it's very difficult to improvise with, within the context of an orchestra because everything is meticulously written. In fact, a lot of the classical musicians that I know who are like absolutely astounding playing Bach or like Schubert or Schumann, Mahler, when you say, well, can we have a moment of improvisation? Like, you know, they go like, I don't improvise. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> we come from, you know, my, my experience has been mostly with people who improvise. I'm, I work with Bobby McFerrin, Ornette Coleman, uh, a lot of people who come from the whole idea that improvisation is a philosophical statement and is a philosophical state of being in which you could, like, be in front of a situation and, and 
use the whole of you to be sensitive towards this situation, and I wish that this mentality would become more of a global common ground of like people using their psyche and their wisdom and intelligence to deal with all these unusual circumstances that were uh, thrown at us on a daily basis. So this piece is called Quo Vadis, and it's, it's beautiful, and I, I'd like you to experience it. Um, Quo Vadis is uh, where you're going, but also I just found out that it is also when St. Peter met Jesus the last time. So where are you going, Jesus? Jesus said, I'm going to Rome to get crucified. And so um, I think I didn't know that, but somehow um, it's there um, in this performance. And also the second part of that was another invitation to go to Poland, happily, in, to Warsaw, to perform at the 50th anniversary of Polish Solidarity. And so are you sure you want to invite an Iranian woman to come in and mourn for you? And they said, yes, we do. And so I went, and I was in this hotel surrounded by police because a lot of the heads of state, 6,000 people, attended this second show. And the next morning, we had a lot of Polish vodka that night before after the show. We really just, they kept offering us, like, this is pepper vodka, and this is like this. I'm like, OK. And I just, so I woke up at 10 AM to go to the airport, and I was going to have a little breakfast. So I'm here like completely with like I hope I'm totally like not seen by anyone having my breakfast and this gentleman over there sitting at another table with a nice mustache looking at me, he keeps looking at me as if like he wants to start a conversation and I'm like arrogant as ever, going like not interested, not interested. So I'm having my breakfast and I keep saying this guy is looking at me in a way that maybe we know each other or something. Anyway, I couldn't get myself together because of the hangover to find out what was going on. As soon as he stepped out, nine people approached him, and then he left the hotel. And I asked the waiter, who is that? He said, it's Lech Valesa. <laughs> I felt like an idiot because I really was a fan of his. So anyway, that happened after this, the second performance that you see. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, I'm not sure what exactly is happening with sound, but, but you get the gist of it. It leaves us some time to, to talk about things. It was a very profound experience, especially the second time. Thank you. Thank you. And the second half was uh, performed in the square where they had lost many, many, many soldiers in that uh, time of solidarity. So it was very special to perform there. Um, so. Let me see what, what we have left before we can open the conversation. Um, oh, so um, I, I moved to LA 12 years ago. Uh, it was always like, forget about LA. It was like this, forget about this place. We were in New York, and in New York is in Los Angeles. Like, no, I don't think so. Not now. But then I got involved in film music, and I was invited by Jan to go and work with him with the same orchestra in Los Angeles, perform at the Royce Hall. And it was zero degrees in New York, and we were given a house on the beach in LA, February, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly it was like, I think we're going to stay. So we moved, finally detached from New York, and uh, which was a ma major thing, um, because I, am, I consider myself a New Yorker more than any other place I've ever lived in. Uh, it was the formation of my sensibility comes from New York, and I'm grateful, uh, I'm indebted to New York's absolute state of openness when I moved there in the 1980s to support artists with their own vision, not pressuring them into talking about their geographic landscape they came from and the complexes related to all the stuff that's like progressive artists, like we run away from the common denominator to just be able to breathe and also create fresh air for others to possibly breathe, you know. And then people pinning you down to this, you know, pseudo projection of the projection and they're like, you're like, hey, you know, I can't be a teacher and an artist at the same time. There's just not enough time. So New York provided an environment where we could just fly and everybody, if you didn't fly, they would just tell you this is the exit sign. So um, in LA, um, I suddenly realized after like 25 years of being away from Iran that there is this, still, this reality called Terangelis. Mm -hmm. And close to 900 people, Iranian people, live in Los Angeles, close to a million and a half in California. And whether you wanted to be, you know, interacting or not, every dentist and every corner and every boutique of like chic and every building of architectural importance was owned by Iran. It was just absolutely like a culture shock. So I thought, you know, um, it's very arrogant of me to have any ideas about my own culture except for trying to reach out. And I thought, what would I do to connect to this community? And uh, many years after, I've loved uh, the poet filmmaker, uh, Farooq Farooq Sad, who's one of the most important modernist poets of Iran. I thought maybe I would do a project with her poetry because it really reflected my era of being in Iran. And then also, it had so much to do with human rights, women's rights, everything that stood between women and, and uh, modernism that she fought for, she was accused of, she suffered for, and she died at the age of 32. So I said, well, what a, what a sister to have, and I'm going to like really get into this. It took four years, a lot of, hi, I'm this person, can you like give me funds for that thing? And we found the money, we did the produ production, it was at the Royce Hall, um, and then at uh, Wallace, and then it ended up, the last performance we had, it was at the um, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, they allowed us to do uh, their first ever stage production in the heart of the Egyptian wing, in the middle of all the effigies and all the mummies. And so the last performance was there. So this project is uh, talking about sensory. It was also an occasion for me to bring my sensibilities in dance, in theater, in visual arts, in, uh, in uh, drama, uh, on stage, 
especially since Farouk's work is also very synergistic. She was a visual artist, she was a filmmaker, she was a progressive artist, she was a, uh, a feminist, humanist, more importantly, a humanist, and she did a documentary called The House is Black, which won many prizes in its own time. And this documentary is 11 Days in a Leper's Colony, where she visited this leper's colony and did this absolutely astounding masterpiece of visiting these people who literally are eaten away by leprosy. Some of them have one eye and one nose. But the way this was shot and the way it was uh, produced, it completely, after three minutes of seeing this, you completely forget that this is ac absolutely repulsive to watch. You become so one with these people, with their misery, with their shortcomings, with their humor, with their weddings, with their playing music, with their kids. And in fact, she adopted a child from that uh, uh, leper colony and uh, took him to, to Tehran, and now he lives in Munich, and he's a poet and a philosopher himself. And I've been blessed by being in touch with him. He supported me in, in this project I did. So this, I just play a trailer because it's a saga, so you would see the sensibility of this. This was the premiere at Royce Hall, and after that, uh, I also did an exhibition installation based on some of the tableaus, uh, every poem became a, it was like a woven um, combination of uh, interpretation of a poem leading into a fragment of his, her life and what caused her to write this kind of poetry. So it's a kind of a woven, very textured piece. It's called The House's Black Media Project. This is one of the video installations based on one of her most wonderful poems uh, called uh, Dawn of the Cold Season. The wind's blowing through the street, and I think of the flowers mating, but on thin and meaning stems, and this tired to her pure time. And the figure of a man passes by the dank trees. A man whose ropes of blue veins have wound up about his throat like dead snakes, pounding those bloody circles in his angry temples. On the threshold of the cold season, at the death watch of the mirrors and the lamentations of pale vicissitudes, at this dusk, Pregnant with the wisdom of silence. How can you say stop to someone walking like that, patiently, heavily, lost? How can you tell him he's dead? He's never lived. I'm cold, and I think I can never be warm again. I'm naked. Naked, naked, 
making us the hush between the words of love. All my wounds come from loving. Love it. Love it. Love it. So this was our visual presentation. Now we can, um, we have two incredibly interesting and, um, and amazing curators here and I'm gonna lend myself to you and then I think there would be a, if you'd like to have a question, I'm here for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, this is an amazingly rich and uh, really provocative on so many levels uh, presentation of only some highlights of your career, which obviously we are just getting glimpses into it. And for that, really, I, I greatly uh, appreciate this and deeply thank you for having gone through all of this. I'm sure this was a journey into the past that... It was. <laughs> and, and we have to also thank I, uh, Valley to yes, push exactly. me into like, um, saying like, why do you think anyone would be interested in any of this? <laughs> exactly. This is what we are going to talk about. Tell us why do you think we should be interested in all of, the, uh, in some of these in particular. So uh, we will just start with a uh, perhaps a pointer and I want to start with the last thing you showed if I may as a way for you to talk a little bit more about it. Um, the uh, project House is Black is uh, enormously uh, effective and effective for a lot of people including anyone who grew up in Iran in the uh, 60s and 70s and grew up with this memory of of Furur, and in so many ways, it's as if you're merging with her in a in a different um, um, installation and reincarnation of those ideals and ideas. Would you talk a little bit more about this? This was just a snippet of what you have done with uh, with Furur's uh, poetry, uh, and and also talk about a, a little bit about the visual aspects. You said that he, she was indeed, that film is remarkable. remarkable. Anyone who has never seen remarkable. that film, you ought to go see it. It's really... It really is... Um, it, it offers you back the humanity that you kind of like... We're in touch with our humanity, but some things really bring you to the core, to your heart. And I've been re recently listening to a lot of brain scientists and um, one of them was talking about the, the heart and that situation with the feeling your heart and creating certain kind of alchemy in your blood. It's a real situation. So it's not just a metaphoric thing to say, oh, it's a my heart. Actually, is, there's this human heart. And so the film really brings you to that place and it's, it's, it's pretty astounding in that way. My, one of the most interesting aspect of this, uh, wanting to do something with Furu Farah Saad was, um, the idea that when you're, uh, especially female artists in progressive artists, for some reason people don't know that you, all you're trying to do is to connect the, the cosmic and transcendental aspect of our being, uh, introduce that to your audience, to, to take me and you both away from the linear, the, the controlled, the, the prefabricated, and it's very hard to be Iranian and to be a woman and to be provocative and not constantly be questioning about things that are like so first degree. And you just like, look, I spent my whole life in exile because of my art. I don't feel like answering questions that have to do with projection of projections of projections of hangups. I have to grow as an artist. So you could sound arrogant or something. And I think Furur was that kind of figure in her own time because her poetry was really, some people think Furu was the Ezra Pound of uh, mm. Iranian, uh, in uh, that language. Rich, existentialist, she was actually friends with Sartre. Uh, apparently she had a journey in, in, in Europe after she lost the custody of her child because she wrote at the age of 18 a poem called Sin, which in English is like, oh well, they love, they made love, and it's, it's a scene about she's saying, I gave myself to this warm, voluptuous, 
pair of arms. And we're talking about like a long time ago. And this poem was published by an intellectual newspaper called Roshan Fair in Tehran, and it was scandalous and created such a, they, they, they had to close the, uh, this very interesting newspaper. And Furu was, had to divorce the husband. She lost the custody of her child uh, because of sin. And she kind of ended up in a psychiatric hospital, got uh, treatments, and then she had to leave Iran because her, she comes from a military family. And the family said, we don't want to have anything to do with you. So she actually ended up in psychiatric hospital. Then she left Iran to Europe and studied film editing out of the blue. She came back, she meets this very interesting filmmaker, producer, Ibrahim Golestan. Anyway, they become um, a couple. And he tells her to, why don't you fly? Just, just do your thing. And he was really instrumental in having Furu finding a grounding to write what she wrote. But having said all of that, is that she, she was going through the same idea of like, oh, who is this light-headed woman writing poetry like that with the language of Rumi and language of Hafez and the language. It's like, well, you know, the languages were there to make you be a much more transcendental figure. But if you can't support uh, the next level of things, then you're talking about stagnancy. And stagnancy in Sufism, in Buddhism, there's no sense of stagnancy. It's the cyclical reality, the cyclical reality. Things are nothing in, in permanent state of flux. Everything's constantly changing, constantly moving. And so is our intelligence and our uh, level of understanding of things. So considering all of that, I felt like if I were going to work with, a, with, a, with an Iranian uh, artist, woman uh, that I understood and I went to high school in Iran. I'm actually a home girl. I, I left at the age of 17 uh, to Europe. I was pretty much in Iran prior. So I have a pretty good understanding and panoramic understanding the, of the society in Iran prior to the revolution. And uh, that's a whole different uh, conversation. But she became someone that I thought, you know, I could, I could you know, there, there was a sense of sisterhood. I understood her struggle. And I decided to, to, to work with her poetry and to honor the work that she did. And uh, people don't know her, but like in five or six years, it's going to be like a Frida Kahlo situation where everybody wants every nail of her in a museum or every, you know, it's that kind of thing. So I thought I would maybe in my lifetime I could honor her work and also through my own experience also share some, some mutual uh, subjects to, to introduce. Modernism and women, it's always, especially from ethnic background, people think it's a mistake. It's like, it's like, what? You know, you have that heritage that comes from like millions of years ago. I said, yeah, uh, I'm happy to have been uh, blessed with that, but I think futures and matters. I think artists matter who take the past into the future with the right kind of synthesis, with the right kind of sensibility. It's a very big responsibility. People are allowed to tell you you're pretentious. Why do you think you could do that? But all artists also uh, should be allowed to say, I'm spending my life on it. So you're not spending your life on it. I'm spending my days on, mm. in this illusion. So I should be able to, 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 to do this. You know. Mm. And so anyway, we did this project. It took a long time. But I said, if I'm not going to take this, because every time I pr propose this project, that was really revered in the US to other promoters. And everyone says, what is the budget? I'm like, the budget is the budget of one photograph of some of my girlfriends in the art world, which is absolutely nothing. But it's, a, it's an elaborate production, I understand. And um, hopefully we will, you know, hopefully, and if people are lucky, we will bring it to other places where people are lucky to see it. That's all I can say. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> That's a hint um, <laughs> to those in London who can manage this sort of thing. I, can I take this, this uh, something you said and, and just uh, push it a little further and then pass the baton to Vali, perhaps? Is, uh, you made that point about how being modern uh, somehow is understood to be in um, in opposition to a, an ethnic, quote-unquote, 
um, existence and, and women in particular are taken uh, to task on this uh, very much. That, that burden of heritage, of culture, of you know, thousands, millennia of, of production, of high art on all levels, in languages, in poetry, uh, visuals, spatial, and so forth, somehow as shackles on uh, production of uh, new ways of thinking about that culture or different ways of thinking about one's culture or one's place. So it, in a way you're pointing to one of the most critical issues which has to do with the way, for instance, um, Shirin Neshot was packaged as an Iranian in exile and not necessarily as a modernist Iranian right. artist. And, right. And that certain aspects of your vocalization may be uh, may be seen in those terms somehow um, irre ir um, irrevocably connected to a long past. So how do you how do you speak to that other than just saying, well, leave me alone. I'm not I'm not going well, down. You know, um, I think that. As you grow older, um, you experience this sense of mater maternity, maternal sense towards people who come and see you, they listen to you, and this idea of just revolting because you're like, I want to do this, it becomes very redundant. What matters is that to, to have constructive conversations and tell people, it doesn't matter what your journey is, what your pa if you're passionate about 19th century miniature, um, of Iran, if you're passionate about uh, no theater of Japan, if trance music from Morocco, that's absolutely wonderful. But don't define what I should be interested in. Right. I am a whole person, and I can decide, right. and I could fail, and I could learn. And so, but it takes a long time not to be angry and pretend and, 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 and look pretentious, especially as a woman, as, a, as an intellectual ethnic woman on the scene. It takes a long time to, and a lot of meditation, a lot of meditation on, on, on taming your anger and taming your frustration into like, there's a time in life that you have to become a teacher. You've lived enough situations. You've gone through a lot of ups and downs. There's a time in life that, that you need to, uh, have your own suffering or your own frustration become uh, uh, to teach you how to how to see it in someone else and just to tell them, look, you know, I I kind of feel what you're going through and this is this is what I can say and I think for me is I love absolutely absolutely love the fact that I was born in a country like that with tradition as such so textured so profound so. But I'm also angry at my culture. How, with this sophistication and this level of uh, depth, how did we fall into this gutter of absolute, you know, redundancy? And and then again, you could never mix state of politics with the state of transcendence because these are have always been throughout history and time. They've always there's always been uh, an issue with things that make you transcend and make you experience your cosmic realm and things that keep pulling you down to the gravity, first degree gravity, so that they can control your anxiety mm. instead of your, your surrendering and your bliss. So I just think that it's just a matter of um, seeing it coming and instead of being angry at it and, and, and barking and and just try to help other people understand uh, that you're a sophisticated person and you worked hard on becoming uh, knowledgeable about some things you're talking about. And you will always work hard at, instead of getting angry at them, yeah. that you will listen. Maybe they have something to tell you that you never thought about. And that is very possible, yeah. very frequently. Yeah. But. Otherwise, it's a vicious circle of me being angry with them, them being angry with me, me being angry with like this person, that person, the shortcomings, the social shortcomings in our time, especially under the political circumstances we all now uh, survive, is, uh, I mean, I think we need wisdom and I, I think we need really to meditate. And every day, I think we need to transcend the lower self to a higher self. So we could deal with things in a, in a, in a more um, paternal and maternal way. Just 
forgive mm. and learn, mm. you know. I know this would sound like really like absurd if I said that 20 years ago even to myself because I'm like, oh dear, you've lived in California for a long time. <laughs> But I, I really, it's just the, the stuff that I, I think that the experiences. Um, Beach from so, houses yeah. in Los Angeles do that to So the after. one thing that I think it yeah. would turn this into a more fun yeah. uh, circumstance is that Valley and I had discussed yesterday, we were talking about uh, this concept of extended vocal techniques, mm -hmm. right. which you heard in some of this music. So I think Valley wanted to kind of be a troublemaker and ask me some questions about, let's get back to the, to the art and less philosophy and just see what we can make you laugh a little bit. Laughter is great, diaphragmic <laughs> movement makes you oxygenate. And any time you can laugh, it's good for you and I think for, for the planet. That's right. Um, <laughs> there have been lots of conversations. Here comes an intellectual agreement. <laughs> right. Yes, um, <laughs> we've had lots of conversations over the last week. Um, I'll just uh, do a little um, quick run through things uh, we, because Suzanne has prepared pictures also to share with you. Uh, the, the, there is a point of intersection. I did a m massive research on the space of the Shiraz Persepolis uh, Festival of Arts, and I do really, truly believe that Susan is one of the few, but one of the most important Iranian um, artists who's really come through that experience, which was the Shiraz Persepolis Festival that ran between 67 and 77. And she will um, tell us She can tell us a lot about that. But also, we've been talking a lot about how, in in, 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 with, with, the, with the view and vision, to supplant the so-called European tradition, to surmount that, and to equalize Asia and Africa on, a, on, on, on an equal platform with European traditions, how they really tapped into certain ideas, but also certain techniques. So one of them was actually to get, to get rid of the text to return to the, to the, to the um, so-called primitive, which was expressed through the performative, as opposed to the um, reliance on text and narrative, which had become very much the European tradition, for example. Sound and resonance, for example, how those kind of um, ideas were being experimented. And Susan asked me to read a couple of sentences from that period of the festival where she also got involved in the 70s in Iran. So the ideas were that the traditions and sensibilities of China, India, Indonesia, Japan, and various African spaces provided abstractive capacities which resonated with the neo-avant-gardist drives around the world as they had done for people like Nietzsche and Arto and others previously. The performative, represented by the so-called primitive, was encouraged to supplant the textual or European tradition. The investigation of ritual itself was seen to be a promise and an insight into the unconscious world of the collective on the basis that it brought theater closest to its essence. Ideals articulated and pursued by Arto of catharsis communality and return to origins were directed towards a desire to connect with the emotional core of drama. A primary intention was the omission of text as carrier of symbolic meaning. This was consciously in line with the idea that the logical and discursive intentions which speech you ordinarily uses in order to ensure its rational transparency were subordinated in the direction of a purer meaning attainment of meaning would transcend the need for rational discourse. So this sort of takes us back to the very beginning of your, your declaration that you're beyond language, or even you said anti-language, mm -hmm, right. non-linear, non-narrative. Right. So we've had this sort of circular conversations, and th th this is material that um, I had written around the Shiraz Festival, and sh perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your very, very early beginnings there. Right. Well, when I lived in Tehran, I was a ballet dancer, part of the Pars National Ballet. Ballet company affiliated with Persian National Television, so we had monthly programs there. 
half of the concentration of the company was contemporary classical dance and music. I mean, we had choreographed pieces to Bella Bartok or Varese. Um, and then the other half was this pride in reviving ir Iranian um, folklore, which to us in those days, Tehrani girls, was not very known because everybody was into either American um, radio stations or uh, disco was hot. And uh, so this was uh, a very cultural um, niche for this company to make it trendy for Iranian youth to know about their own, uh, the regional folklore. So every year we were sent to the Caspian Sea uh, in the residency for, for a month, and they would bring these musicians and dancers from all over Iran, and to, for us to study with the actual musicians and dancers from these places. And that was the first time I realized I had an out-of-body experience with seeing a uh, a tradition that had come from the south of Iran, probably connected to Africa through the Indian Ocean. And these are actually the people that we uh, studied with. They came from all over the Kurdish, the, the Luristan, the Bakhtiaris, all the different tribes. They brought their, um, their dance form and music to us. The one more thing about this dance company that was very interesting is because of its affiliation with Persian National Television, we were, as, uh, as uh, members of the company, we were sent to the Shiraz International Arts Festival every year to be like interns and to, st to see the work that all these amazing artists who came to Iran from the Living Theater to John Cage to Bob Wilson to literally everyone who was doing anything completely progressive and interesting was subsidized and commissioned by this festival. It created a lot of tension, understandably, but it also really helped the international avant-garde at that point. And then one night you would see the Living Theater, and the next night you would see Kechak from Indonesia or Parisa from Persian classical mm -hmm. vocalist. And it gave a sense of pride that something so indigenous and ethnic and deep and deep, deeply rooted in one culture could be standing next to something that's the most progressive, like the music of Stockhausen, being experienced in the in the in the in Persepolis, or the concept of the music by John Cage. You know, so for me that was for me was the the mecca of uh, of really visiting the roots and also the international avant-garde, and that has never stopped being my core interest in what I do, roots and progression. And I, I consider myself uh, definitely a, a daughter of that, that festival. And then um, I met Maurice Bejar, the wonderful French choreographer, who was a philosopher, anthropologist, historian. He came from a, a philosopher father, and his perspective was really profound and interesting, especially in the early days. And I asked him if I could dance with his company. He said, yes, you have to come to Brussels and audition, and we will see. So, and I did. I left the med school behind, and I went to uh, the dance school in Brussels, and I got in, and that the journey of my, uh, my European um, studies started at that point. And here's me and Bejar, completely infatuated by his charismatic, knowledgeable, and amazing, amazing person who sadly passed. Mm -hmm. He famously did uh, uh, pieces at the Shiraz Festival that were commissioned. He did them, he did his contemporary ballets to Persian traditional mm -hmm. music, the most famous one being called Golestan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely so beautiful, absolutely beautiful. To have like 70 dancers in, in, uh, in white, beautifully white uh, designed clothes, but based on the Sufi, the Kurdish, and with this music that I, to this day, I never forget, uh, dancing in, in, in the landscape of Persepolis, uh, it, it was really most exquisite. Uh, and so many artists came to Iran that, you know, you can imagine for a teenager growing up in Iran and um, being involved already in the arts, suddenly seeing these magnificent pieces in the heart of Shiraz Bazaar, and on different stages in the city, and the tomb of Hafez, the Sufi poet Hafez, was absolutely magnificent for everything that came from Dagar brothers, the North Indian classical musicians, to, to Persian classical music, to uh, Bharat Anatyam and Katakali, uh, flamenco. It was really, really rich, and curator curatorially speaking, it was, I think it's, to this day, is probably one of the most interesting festivals that has 
uh, that I've ever been to because this combination of non-colonialistic approach to putting a, you know, indigenous, deep, deeply rooted in tradition uh, group on the same stage the next night, Bob Wilson, let's do that all the time. Because, <laughs> because all the surrealists, European surrealists, they all were inspired by, by, by ancient rituals. They all left behind. They, that's, why, that's how the theater of new language, the language is a parasite, the language is a virus. That, that's the concept that was born out of the Dada into surrealism, into adoration or not uh, actually disdain of language. To go back to the primordial, to the languages that, uh, that you experience in your mother's tomb, but you, they didn't have uh, psycholo psychology attached to them. Yeah. These primordial languages that came out of emotions and came out of... I was just talking to Vali, I said, sometimes you have these words that are missing, uh, you want to translate from one language to another, and you see, it is impossible because it's the vibration and the alchemy of this language that could never be translated it has to be experienced in this language and not that language. And, and this shows you the power of languages and also the, the shortcomings of languages. So a whole bunch of theater um, and, um, and intellectual discourse on the necess necessity of language was born out of that. The Polish director, uh, Grotowski, was, uh, well, Arto was behind, I mean, before him, but mm. Grotowski literally established a theater of, of no languages. The actors would come on stage. He would completely feel them, hear them, but they would never use a language. A language was an extension of an emotion. And their own words, this notion of uh, the trainings of Bhutto and then the Japanese training of Suzuki, all based on martial arts, no languages, uh, and, and it, a whole series of very deep philosophical uh, art forms were born out of this idea that do you need language? What's the limitation and what's the possibilities of languages? So uh, it, was, it was very interesting that this whole group of mm. things took place th th in the discourse of language. Mm. And all of that abstraction is quite visible and solidly sort of manifested in that very big piece that we showed in the beginning as Aksatra. Yes, myself. that was really the time that I, I, I just was not, um, I had absolutely no uh, obligation towards, uh, you know, using a language. Later on, of course, you know, I, I did an album uh, based on the mystic poetry of Iran, which is very humbling uh, to even hear and understand that for us, uh, Iran has been colonized through the Arab invasion and the languages got in, but the fact that you could still understand the languages of the mystics of like 13th century, 7th century, it, it's really a very special thing to, to, uh, to, to experience for, for Iranians. So I, I felt like it, it's important at some point to, to return to the language of the mystics and, and, and celebrate it. And we, I did an album uh, that was also musically um, uh, a fusion of different sensibilities in jazz, in classical music, in mystical Persian music, Persian classical music. It came out 25 years ago called Madman of God, but Madman of God in the sense of Sufi tradition, because madness in Sufism is a, is a sign of abundance and arriving at an ecstatic and transcendental existence. And um, that album was called Madman of God, and, and it was really well embraced, considering it was, it was released 25, 30 years ago. Mm. So, um, um, oh, you want to play? I'm sorry. Um, I am very <coughs> conscious of the time as well. If, if. <laughs>
This was an extraordinary presentation for us. And if I may make a point, using language to make that presentation <laughs> available to us. <laughs> I, I totally agree and understand what you're saying. But I think one of the key aspects of the Shiraz Festival was the fact that it transcended the linguistic divides and brought from the north to the south, from east to west, mm -hmm. and really a pioneer on the stage, which then we come to understand as world music. And it really precedes all of these in very effective manner. So while I do completely understand your point in anti-language approach, um, the Rumis and the Hafizes and the Furughs would not be with us without it. So I want to make that point as well. <laughs> So, um, I think uh, we would be uh, perhaps best served if we all have a drink with Suzanne uh, and ask questions uh, during the drinks in our research forum seminar room, which is on the second floor. And please take the elevators uh, or the stairs to reach there and come and join us. And please yeah. join me in thanking Susan Dehim and Zahim Akluji for joining us.